Call Roy at 800-866-8883. The foundation of human understanding teaches an observation exercise, often called meditation, which permits you to become objective toward your problems and allows your heartaches, bad habits, fears, and anxieties to be completely eliminated from your life without effort on your part. Until you have begun to practice this exercise, much of what you see and hear on the following program may be shocking and upsetting to you. But if you will listen calmly and with an open mind, you may discover the key to the peace of mind and joy for which you've been searching all of your life. And now from the foundation of human understanding, here is Roy Masters. Hello. We're going to do something different tonight. I'm going to have a guest. And his name is Craig Wynn, and he wrote the book um, Tea with Terrors. But before I take him on just a second, I don't have guests on my show. Very, very, well, I wouldn't say won't. I rarely have it, because when they come up with the subject, I'm only interested in the subject of politics, because I understand psychological warfare and it is a sort of evil Way, uh, knowledge of the human mind and the human weakness to bring us all down. And I'm sure our guest is going to be have something to say about that. But I know more about that than psychiatrists and psychologists. I know I know more about doctors, about stress-based diseases than doctors do. They know nothing. And I, so I don't need to know, to have people on that know, uh, you know, less than I do. I don't need, to, I don't need to talk to people who don't really understand anything and can't really contribute much on this program, but I think this man, Craig Wynn, is going to be able to provide that that little challenge I need sometimes on this program. And he's a host of Shattering Myths. I'm just reading something. He's a program devoted to exposing political, religious, that's good, military, economic misconceptions. Accomplished entrepreneur and has taken two companies public, done. And I think I just don't read all this. I'm just going to welcome him. Hello, Craig. How are you? <laughs> Hello, Roy. It's a <laughs> pleasure. I, I hope I can live up to uh, to that introduction, but I can certainly see why in the uh, the past uh, you have rightly decided that it is better to speak directly to your audience than it is to interview someone that, that knows less than you do. Yes, uh, but I, I'm looking at you. The reason why I am as interested in you is because you've got so much experience. You've gone to how many... How many places? I didn't have time to, to to spell it all out. Oh, I've traveled in about 200 countries, uh, so I've seen much of the world. You know, the more you're exposed to the various cultures and and the way people live, it gives you a pretty interesting perspective, a, a way to to make connections and to analyze uh, the the various influences of of some of the ailments of society. And I'm I'm not a fan of religion or of politics, and I see... Well, I'm not either. ...very effective uh, brainwashing tools. Uh, have you noticed that uh, I have been around a little bit, you know, Africa and places, <laughs> but have you noticed that in the places where... Uh, where everywhere, when I, let me just say, re, 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 reword my thought. Uh, every culture has its own craziness. Yes. And, and people born into it, sort of take it on. And right. they think they're Italian, they think they're uh, um, um, Zulu. They they actually act out the part that they've been programmed in, into them to the, to, from their country, from their culture, and they th they think that's, who's that, that's who they are. But every now and then, you will find a person who is a Zulu, a Chinese person, uh, a, a, a Russian, uh, a pygmy, and, and you'll find there's a soul in there that is something we share in common. Do you, have you ever seen that? Yeah, but my, most of my evaluations of cultures are uh, more religiously and politically uh, identified and driven than they are racially uh, identified or driven. But uh, yes, uh, in fact, one of the great thrills of, of doing what you and I do is uh, we have the opportunity to engage those who are willing to stand up above the the crowd. It's something that very few people are willing to do because it's uh, not only scary there, but most people don't take kindly to those who uh, put their head above the crowd. It's, oh, absolutely. It's a very vulnerable position. And there's a reason for that, because truth hurts. I think that is true, and it's not popular. You know, before uh, 
uh, this evening. I, although I know your uh, son quite well, and we've done uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, work together, this is the first opportunity we've had to talk, and I figured I'd just Google and find out what I could uh, learn quickly. I, I always find it uh, interesting. You, uh, you share um, two traits that uh, I rather admire. One is that your critics uh, only attempt to, uh, to attack you via the ad hominem argument. I couldn't find anyone that could contradict or debate anything that you had said using uh, evidence and reason. Not a single person. So they only, uh, your, your foes only criticize you via ad hominem arguments. And the second that was interesting is that most people who are threatened by the truth typically turn uh, to, uh, to label uh, whoever it is that they don't like by saying they're involved in a cult. Yeah, that's so right. They, they, they defame you, you, you vilify you. That, as do yeah. I. And yet, yeah. I can't see where there's any cult involved here. Well, that stuck. That when I first began, when I appeared on the scene, um, I I worked in my own business and and developed the Institute of Hypnosis for seven years in in Houston, Texas, and I discovered all the things I I speaking about today. Uh, practicing hypnotherapy and then i realized that there's another side of this there's another si there's 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 two sides of human spirit there's the, the, the pressures of life will convert you into whatever culture you're born into and you can't break it it's very hard to break it and if you start stand up above the crowd for example if you were born in borneo and you tried you have a twinkle in your eye that you are different from everybody else but you see them for what they are and they don't want to see be seen for what they are they'll put you in a soup pot in the manner of speaking, they'll kill yes. you. See, so, yes. so in well, in America, in we never had that in America, though. In America, we used to, there was a commonality here. It, it was a place where the commonality of the human race, the kind of thing I, I spoke about a few moments ago about finding person in, in Timbuktu that is not infected by the culture, but it has a little secret, but that secret is a commonality between him and me, or you know, so that we both see the same thing, the same common sense, the same light. And that's what I want. I just, just say that for what it's worth to part. Yeah, what I have found, though, that if almost in any culture, if you say things that are critical of uh, whatever the, the prevailing wisdom is of that uh, culture, and it's very seldom is uh, wisdom because it's usually an indoctrinated idea. But if in America, for example, if you're not patriotic and you share reasons why you know, you you may not want to be patriotic. There's some serious concerns about uh, government and politics that you ought to You're, be aware You of. should hear me. Boy, you should hear you rail get about that. You should heckled for that. Yeah. No, uh, we, uh, we, we, we're we going to have another break. Just a break in a minute, Craig. Would you hold the line just a second? Sure. Uh, but we have a... I, I want to talk to you about Obama, please. If you did. Would you mind talking about him? I and don't know. Obama. Oh, certainly. You don't mind talking about him? Yeah. Uh, yeah I am... W would I you preface it by saying that I'm not uh, political. I'm. Uh, I would. I, I used to be, but uh, I'm. Uh, I'm not anymore. Uh, but I would rate uh, Obama. Hold a, hold a second. Oh, I have to interrupt you because we. You hear that music, Craig? Don't you? That means we're going into a break. We'll be right back in three minutes. What's on your mind? Call Roy at 1-800-866-8883. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, my friends, uh, you heard me speak to Craig Wynn about he not being political, and I'm not really. But when I see my country, I mean, the country that I, I, I loved, the country I came to because I had a commonality when I looked across the waters, I could see a commonality through the movies, I saw it. And I said, I want to be one of you guys. That was 65 years ago. But not, you're not the same anymore. You're not the same people. And so, uh, but in, in America, that commonality could have spread if it wasn't poisoned by um, social, the socialism. I mean, uh, there's something about socialism you need to know. It's a worm. And I, you can say, well, you're political. No, I'm in the business of of routing out evil. 
and I've been I'm, I know from my work that you know there is such a thing as good and evil. I mean, evil uses stress to condition you, and you it 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 understands your weakness and and exploits them. And it's very difficult to to break that spell. And uh, our country is being manipulated by social engineering, and I understand all of that. And I have a counter social engineering. I know how to counter it by counter psychological warfare. I understand that perfectly. And if I had a couple of million dollars, and I keep saying this, I'm going to say this one more time, maybe tomorrow, and I'm done with it. I need a. If I could have a, a, a couple of million dollars or less, I have my finger on a trigger. I cannot tell you what it is. I have 300 stations right now, but there's something else that's going on that I've come across. And if I had that money, I could change this country forever, back to what it used to be, the, the, the beautiful place I came to and the beautiful people. They weren't all beautiful people, the stuff in the South. You don't get me wrong. It wasn't perfect, but it was becoming. And all of a sudden, things begin to turn around and we become infected, indoctrinated, schools, etc. But there's a way of undoing all that. And if you don't know how to undo it, but first of all, you have to undo it. Undo the effect it has on you. It's a game, psychological warfare, and you're all part of it. And you're doing to others, when you're affected by it, you turn around and infect other people. And those people turn around and affect other people. It's a chain of command. And pretty soon we lose who we are. And it cannot happen to America. I, if, if anybody has enough money, lots of people give money to all kinds of useless things. If you could just, uh, I've never asked for the money before, but I, I want to do it to bring this country to turn it around. I know how to turn it around. I have my finger on a button. And I cannot tell you what it is. Okay, you know where to send the money. Little or a lot. But please, I'm Roy Masters. Thank you. listening to Advice Line with Roy Masters. You can reach Roy at 1-800-866-8883. That's 1-800-866-8883. Now, we're back to um, Craig Wynn, and uh, I haven't told you everything about him, but I just share, me what, share with us, um, Craig, what you would like to say. Just spout it out, and let me see what, what, something, what that thing is important to you about uh, what the problems were with uh, Obama and just oh yeah yeah I was, uh, yeah, yeah directly to answer your question it's it's really a combination of things one is he is a, an extremely beguiling liar uh, absolutely I've never heard a, absolutely I've never heard a politician whose whose proclivity to lie is is uh, is as excessive as he is yeah. he'll, he'll lie even if the truth serves its interests yeah uh, and, and that's a problem the second is that that economically, as you mentioned in your uh, uh, in the interim there, he is a uh, a socialist uh, bordering on communist. His his State of the Union address actually spoke of administering the U.S. economy as uh, he does as commander in chief over the U.S. military. Uh, he is very much from each according to their ability and to each according to their need. Absolutely, and. and the problem with that is that it is devastating to economic growth and opportunity and incentive. Uh, and so economically, the man has never held a job in his life. He has never even worked for a business, much less run a business. And, and if you combine that with the fact that most of what he says is dishonest, and religiously, he is an absolute mess. He is the epitome of, uh, of evil religiously because he blends... Everything that is wrong with secular humanism, with uh, Islam, and with uh, Christianity together to create an amalgam that is pure poison. Um, and collectively, he has about half of America eating the poison right out of his hand. It's, uh, and, and that's the problem. That's the, that's the critical mass where we have revolution. All, all the, all the, the per people are not so infected will yield for peace, and there is no peace. Yeah, what I'm afraid of, Roy, though, is that... that over the last few decades, we have created a dependent class in America. Oh, yes, of, of Americans are net uh, parasites on government. They're literally dependent upon governments as opposed to 
net contributors. Hey, say, hey Craig, before you go any further, before you, before you go any further, you sound exactly like me. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> you sound, that's, that's, you're doing my job for me. Thank you. The situation, you realize that is the undeniable conclusion. And we well, have created a society that has has voted to steal money from those who are productive and give it to those who uh, want what others have earned. And you can't succeed economically under that basis. Yeah, but that's been going on for, you know, that kind of preparation, the preparation for his coming, so to speak. Oh, yes. It's been going on for 50 years, I know for sure. Yeah. One of the great brainwashing, though, uh, elements of, uh, of all of this is the very currency that we use to uh, to value our economy it uh, it is a promissory note which means it is actually a liability not an asset and it exists uh, as a item of value only because of indoctrination and propaganda uh, it is actually a liability not an asset and you know i can take one of those monopoly if i can i can give a demonstration uh, it's easy to hypnotize people mesmer and it, it's called waking hypnosis they don't even know they're They've been hypnotized. A strong person can do that. A, pers a person with a strong personality can easily persuade people to think something is so when it isn't. But I'm, I'm, I'm rather good at that. If it, I had to be good at it to understand and to undo it. But you can take, I can take a monopoly piece of money and say, and say this is a $20 bill. I want to buy that from you and you take it. Well, that's how, that's how, could, that's how easy it is. Because uh, our currency <laughs> is a liability, not an asset. Yeah, but up to now, we're, we, we are conditioned into thinking it's money. <laughs> so for a little while, correct. it worked. And <laughs> for a little while, it worked. thing, too, is that most people think that inflation is the value of goods and services uh, increasing when all it actually is is the value of the currency depreciating because they've created uh, more of it and more of the currency chasing the same goods and services cause the appearance of those services going up in price, but it's also... Well, yeah, it, it's so, so simple. If, if, uh, to make it simple for the audience, if you are working for a farmer and you, mm -hmm. and you get, uh, you get t 10 bags of, of, of groceries for the day's work because it's all part of stuff in those days. Let's assume that. And then you say, oh, well, I've got nowhere to store this. So the, far so the farmer that you work for gives you uh, 10 pieces of paper, says, I owe you one bag of flour, one bag of carrots. Right. Mm -hmm. And so somebody comes along and f finds, you, finds those notes you have. When they're not looking, they duplicate it and, mm -hmm. and make a copy and go and get one of the bags of flowers. When you come to get yours, <laughs> it's not there, you see. That's so right. you've only got nine bags, but for, for still, you still got 10 notes, and it, so it goes. You know, <laughs> yeah. There's nothing and there. The reason the reason, Roy, all this is important, and, and for uh, some of your listeners, you may wonder, you know, why are we talking uh, economics? Why are we talking uh, politics? But globally, the reason that the world is so close to its uh, uh, to chaos, really, to oh, yeah, its, absolutely. Uh, its end, is because people are so easily manipulated now by politics, by propaganda, by patriotism, and by uh, economic promises that are, are invalid. How about manipulated? How about changing the manipulated into corrupted? I would agree with you completely. But there really isn't. There's a, there's a very short path between manipulated, particularly from the point of being deceived, and manipulated into being corrupted. Yeah, but be deceived is a way of corrupting a person. Absolutely. To, and, that, and it is ultimately the, the, the primarily the primary manipulative tool to deceive people and to give get them to be willing to give up their freedom their free will uh, uh, opportunity uh, wealth everything um, control over their their lives is economically and have you f have you forgive have you and politics with it it's very easy to manipulate people I didn't mean to jump in but um, yes. have you f figured out why people are like sheep to the slaughter that even though they see it coming, uh, uh, half the country sees it company, and the other person doesn't or enjoys the the values of of their leader, you know, the, the robber baron. But half right. the country see it, and the half of the country are smart. They're so, but they're not. But they're somehow they are have lost something uh, through the pleasures of their living because 
they're the ones that have money that they can do what they want with it and and soak themselves in pleasure and, and, and as, a, as a means of dealing with problems they don't know how to deal with even each other so um, I always I always wonder when when people see that their country is being destroyed and it, and we and all of us that you know I count us into what I'm those people I'm talking about all of us see the horror coming down and the country collapsing and being exploited just by a few people at the top, just by a small number, supported by clones, the ones you described, the live the parasites. But we don't. We see the danger. We know that we're going down. Uh, that that we that our civilization will disintegrate completely and the world will collapse if, if America collapses. The world goes, and yet they keep putting it off and putting it off until it's too late. And there is no more. They just can't get it. They can't get. They can't stand up. Don't. They're all afraid. They're already waiting for someone to stand up, and they I might think follow. It's a combination, Roy, of, of several things. For most people, it is very difficult for them to imagine things that are radically different than their today's experience than their yesterday's experience. You got it. So you when you it. tell someone that America is on the cusp of anarchy, that our our way of life is within. 10 to 20 years of no longer existing, that America will no longer be a sovereign nation because of what we have done to ourselves politically, militaristically, uh, economically, that when you tell someone that, they can't fathom it because that isn't their reality, and to go there is way beyond their comfort zone. And I think the second is that so many people have uh, satiated their concerns with all manner of indulgences. You know, for some it's drugs, for others it's alcohol, for others it's gambling, for some it's uh, it's sex or, or pornography. We we are an indulged society that would rather check out of reality than have to face it. Is it? It's a demoralized. See, this the uh, social engineers have to. It's very hard to conquer a, no, a noble people. Mm. And so it's, it's impossible to conquer a noble people. I think so. But you have to demoralize. Uh, I, I'll, re I'll just read you a point, just a, a, a thing right here. Uh, it, this is a book called Brainwashing the Synthesis of the Russian Textbook of Psychology. Just read a few words. By lowering the endurance of a person, a group, or a nation, and by constant uh, degradation and, and defamation, there's the defamation I get, got when I was uh, younger. A state of shock can be induced that will cause an adequate response to any command. And the first thing to be degraded as any nation is the state of man himself. Those with a high ethical tone are difficult to conquer. Blah, 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 blah. It goes on to tell, them how, tell uh, the reader how you can demoralize a whole nation and they will be like sheep to the slaughter. Correct. And, and well, we'll, we be back, we'll be back. We'll be back with uh, Craig Wynn. And he's, a, he's an interesting guest, and we're going to talk about lots of things this evening, and we're going to talk about Al-Qaeda and all the rest of it, because we need to go there, Craig, Craig, anytime you're ready. You can go there and give us information we need to hear. Okay. Are we going to take some calls? Uh, we'll, we'll see. Right. Back. You're listening to Advice Live with Roy Masters. Call Roy at 1-800-866-8883. Listening to Advice Line with Roy Masters. Call Roy at 1 800 866 8883. My guest, I'm, I'm in delighted in his, his insights. His name is Craig Wynn, and he wrote the book, a very famous book. I have never read it. I'm not much of a reader. If it came out in a movie, I hope he has a movie one day, I'll go see it. But <laughs> I'm sure it's a very interesting book. I've been too busy writing them. Um, but, but can we just come to uh, one of the subjects, I think, which is your favorite? It's, it's religion and Christianity and Islam. And I need, I need you to hear your thoughts on all of this. Well, certainly. We're we're talking and painting kind of a, a dark picture, and I think collectively, nationally, the picture is pretty uh, dark. Uh, it is. It we is. might even disagree on the, uh, on the point of, uh, I don't think uh, America 
is uh, redeemable at this point. I think we're too far gone on too many different fronts. But uh, there is individual hope, and I'm sure we'll get to that before our program is uh, yeah, over of course, uh, this of evening because we, we share the optimism there. Uh, my uh, um, transition from being an entrepreneur to to doing what we're doing now, which is uh, trying to share with people insights so that we encourage them to to think and exercise good judgment regarding yes. the information that we can make available to them. Uh, so they really become masters of their own destiny as opposed to uh, just part of the, the flowing tide of humanity, uh, is that uh, I wanted to know immediately after 9-11 as to whether or not our politicians were telling us the truth and the based on what they said, is that, that the Muslims who, who flew planes into our buildings had corrupted their religion, that the religion was peaceful, they had corrupted their religion, and, uh, and that they were therefore extremists, and they were radicals, uh, the opposite of a fundamentalist. And I had a hunch that wasn't true. I actually knew George W. Bush reasonably well. I'd met him before he became president, spent a fair amount of time with him. And I knew what he was going to do because he told me before he was elected that he was going to create a crisis because he wanted to be president over a, a crisis. He thought that would make him more popular. And so, uh, I'm well, what, was, what, was the price, what would be the crisis? He, would, uh, he wanted to uh, declare war. War is the ultimate crisis for uh, a president. And so he felt that if there was a crisis that he would shine and become popular. And when I asked him the, the question before he... Uh, uh, while he was running for president, um, what drives you? What is your passion? What do you care most about? And he says, I look forward to a crisis, particularly uh, as president, because he thinks, he said, that's when... Well, my, wouldn't, he, uh, wouldn't he mean, wouldn't he mean, uh, see, he, Obama he, creates crisis, and then, and when, and, and then when, when he, he, he creates a problem, and then he rises to solve it, and the, solve, the solution is worse... Uh, Correct. The, is, the cure is worse the than the place disease. The difference here, uh, Roy, is that I see both sides of the aisle as uh, is equally bad. I, I yeah, I do the too. Same side of the same coin, and uh, George W. Bush was really no less evil than is uh, Obama. Every everything he said about Afghanistan and Iraq to justify his invasions of both countries were a lie. But you, but you see, you, but Craig, Craig, worse. you, Craig, but you see, you didn't even when George Bush came to office, you didn't have to look very far to see a crisis. It is something that needs to be taken care of. I mean, there was so much of it the day he was inaugurated, uh, and so, and that's I look. I tell you, I do the same thing. I enjoy crisis. The crisis is, and I don't create the crisis, but I don't my I. My very existence creates a wave. My very existence. And so, I enjoy challenges, too, because yeah. with a challenge, you have the opportunity to resolve the, uh, the challenge. And, it's and yourself. the resolution of challenges that we accomplish things of value. In the case of George W. Bush, though, he used outright lies to deceive America so that his response to the challenges was counterproductive. It was even suicidal. So, uh, you know, so yes, did a crisis exist? Yes. Yeah. Did everything he do to respond to it make it worse? That is also true. But, but, but Craig, if you elected me to, to be mm -hmm. um, president, um, and, I, and, and my program is always about solving crisis. I'm always looking for crises to solve. And the crisis in people, that's where I'm working, is the crisis that people have with each other and themselves. So that's my job. I'm looking for the, 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 the crisis. I look for the, the, and the reason for it, so we can overcome it. But life is, life should be that. You can't live in a bottle, in a, in a, in a vacuum. You can't do it. Yes. We ought not, however, create the crisis and then uh, use that crisis that we have created. And to a large degree... Uh, that would be, that's just, you, yeah. Well, that would be... created the, the crisis that he uh, claimed existed through deception... But, and then his response was far worse than the actual uh, incident that he was claiming to resolve. Well, I, I, there was I think intelligent ways to respond, but we didn't use any of them. Well, I think well, you're talking about two different people. Obama is the person 
who likes to create crisis by degrading everybody and then solving the process of de- degradation with solutions that right. create more degradation. Uh, right. uh, Bush wasn't, Bush that, wasn't quite like others, that. They stand above them. Yeah, no, but Bush wasn't quite like that. He's naive. He's a, he's a decent guy, and I don't think he's the kind of person that looks for crisis just for glory. I think he looks. Uh, I think that that's too uh, far too kind, uh, in uh, in all respects. And I, I knew the man reasonably well. Spent a fair amount of time with him. But to to get to uh, to the tea with terrorist uh, example because it is uh, germane to this. Right after nine eleven. Uh, I tried to meet with uh, George Bush before he made his... Why, why would you want to meet him? Why would you want to meet because him? Because I wanted to tell him that, that it was, based on what he had told me, that he was going to respond by uh, declaring war. And on, wh- on who? I, my guess is that he was going to declare war on terrorism. Well, why not? Because... Terrorism is a tactic. You can't declare war on a tactic. Oh, yeah, you, you can. Expect to have uh, to yeah. have any kind of result. It's like uh, yeah, World that's. But, II, let's say let's. We're going to hold the line. Hold the line. <laughs> I, I have to hold. You. Craig, hold the line a second. We're we'll right back. You finish your point. I'm enjoying you. Don't go away. You're listening to Advice Line with Roy Masters. Call Roy at one eight hundred eight six six eighty eight eighty three. Listening to Advice Line with Roy Masters. Call Roy at 1 800 866 8883. You see, um, having Craig on, we're having a nice discussion. Craig, I just want to just start off this last six minutes for this hour. Is that Ronald Reagan, uh, uh, this would play into your thought very much, and where, the, where I agree with you on this. He, he won a war without a shot being fired, but it was an economic war. And he, so our productivity was greater than theirs, and we built bombs and airplanes faster and faster, and they tried to keep up with this, but their economy collapsed. They had to print money in order to keep up with this, and, and they, they, whole, whole communism collapsed, socialism collapsed. And now, so, the, so um, you see, there's a, there's a point there. But we could, if you want to fight the war against al-Qaeda, who don't make anything, they don't produce anything and so where do they get the money to get their bombs and everything from the treachery in our country that keeps us from drilling for oil because if we were oil if we were oil secure then Correct. all of a sudden they would collapse right. they would that's the third plank of my ninth that's where how we should do it but that but because we're not doing it yeah, because we're not yeah, doing one, it. That one plank is the, uh, in fact, back in, the, you've mentioned Tea with Terrace, which was the second of 15 books that I've written. And yeah. In the Tea with Terrace, uh, I present a three-part plan that would end the threat of Islamic terrorism in 90 days. So let's hear it. The, plank, the third plank of that plan happens to be the one that you're mentioning. Good. Which is that if America was uh, energy independent, and if America were to use its military only in one regard, which is to control the wellhead production and distribution of oil in the Islamic countries that use that money to fuel uh, Islamic terrorism and to export Islamic terrorism. There we go. There if we, we go. were to, and we're to use that money also to develop alternative energy sources and domestic energy uh, uh, independence, then the fuel that funds Islamic terrorism would dry up because there is no Islamic country ever that has been successful economically. And that is mostly because to be successful uh, economically, you have to have rule of law. People have to be willing to invest their time and money. Knowing you have to have structure. They yeah. They're going to be treated fairly. That does not exist in any Islamic country. So Islam is bankrupt. They have no fuel for Islamic terrorism. If we uh, stop uh, bribing the, uh, the OPEC nations. Okay, now, that's I got it. Plank. But you need, there's two things that have to come before that. Fair enough. The first of those is something that you have mentioned, and that is that America has lost the high moral ground. We've since, we cease to be a rational uh, and informed people who, who exercise good judgment. 
And until we as a nation learn that political correctness is a terrible disease that has caused Agreed. fear being judgmental, to fear being discerning, we need to, to recognize that political correctness led us down the wrong path and that we need to teach people again how to use evidence and reason to form valid, just, and moral conclusions. I love it. And so that's the first thing. Otherwise, nothing that you say or do is going to matter. Agreed. The, third, the second thing that you have to do, because we, we began with the third, because we're right uh, on, in sync with this. The second thing that you have to do is realize that the enemy in this case is a religion, uh, and that uh, Islam has not just declared war in the United States. Islam has declared war on all humankind. Yes. When Muhammad uh, left uh, Mecca in shame following the satanic verses, he met with a, a group of, uh, of 12 pagans who agreed that they would honor him as the messenger of Allah, and uh, that they would wage war against all humankind on behalf of Muhammad and his wannabe God. And ever since that moment, Islam has been a declaration of war against all humankind. Agreed. The, 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 the most prolific victims of Islam are Muslims. Muslims kill far more Muslims than they do infidels. It makes so, sense. Once you, once you recognize that the enemy is not a tactic, it is the religion. And it's not a corruption of the religion, it's, it's the fundamental nature of the religion. Muhammad was a terrorist. Uh, Muhammad was also a slave trader, he was a kidnapper, he was a mass murderer, he was a pedophile, he was a rapist, he was incestuous. He, he was a very messed up individual. Once you recognize that, then the most effective way to confront a religion, and all religions are based on lies and deceptions, is with the truth, evidence and reason. Demonstrate through the Islamic scriptural sources that Islam is a complete and utter fraud and that it's wholly incongruous with civil society. Now, doing so isn't going to change the mind of someone who's a zealous Muslim in Saudi Arabia. Because right. religion renders people immune to evidence and reason. That's right. But, but what it does do is for people who live in a free society whose minds are open, it makes it far more comfortable for them to be opposed to the religion that they know will destroy them. But let me stop you there. Let me stop you there for a minute. You've had a good run there. Do you think that mm -hmm. the Muslim side of Obama and the, the socialist side of him, because he's had both fathers, do you think that he is a, um, a sleeper and is using, uh, getting, becoming friends with Muslims, encouraging them to, to wage war with America, to wear us out. And so when we're worn out from fighting and, 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 and broken, then the communists will come in and take over, having the Muslims do the job. You're listening to Advice Line with Roy Masters. Call Roy at 1-800-866-8883. The foundation of human understanding teaches an observation exercise, often called meditation, which permits you to become objective toward your problems and allows your heartaches, bad habits, fears, and anxieties to be completely eliminated from your life without effort on your part. Until you have begun to practice this exercise, much of what you see and hear on the following program may be shocking and upsetting to you. But if you will listen calmly and with an open mind, you may discover the key to the peace of mind and joy for which you've been searching all of your life. And now from the foundation of human understanding, here is Roy Matthews. Yes, I think I found a brother from a different mother. So I have on as a guest um, Craig Gwynn, and he's a distinguished author, Tea with Terrorists and other books, an entrepreneur. And I'm having just a jolly good time. And just let me say a few words um, so that some of you who didn't listen to the first hour um, will catch up. And it, these few words really sum up a whole lot. Reagan waged war through economy.
you know, if you see, look at America today, war is being waged by socialism bringing down our economy. That's how you break people. You destroy the economy. That's how the, you go for the throat, the economy. You defeat people that way. However, no. But when it comes to Al-Qaeda and Islam, which is, which is the hot potato right now, um, likewise, we could de defeat Islam and Al-Qaeda and all the rest of that goes with it by drilling for our own oil. Then we wouldn't have to fight because they would collapse. We would collapse their economy. And that's what we should do because we have enough oil in our country to do it. Now, who are the traitors? Now, I'm going to ask my friend, and maybe I'm starting off on the wrong foot, but maybe you tell me, Craig, am I starting off on the right foot or not? Who are the traitors that are keeping us from drilling for oil so we have to... We have to sacrifice our boys on 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 the war you know, front. You're you're right in that that the reason that uh, Islam has gone from being destructive to its own to lashing out and being able to kill uh, infidels is solely because of uh, of OPEC and of America in particular's unwillingness to develop uh, its uh, offshore. Yeah, but who are they? Who are the people that have the power to stop us from drilling? It doesn't make any sense using our own resources. It, That's the question. It's been, it's been both sides of the aisle for a very long time. I agree. I'm not arguing. Everything from fracking to uh, to offshore uh, oil leases to taking uh, a, a company like uh, British Petroleum and uh, deciding that that uh, we should find them uh, in the $20 billion range to discourage anyone else from developing offshore uh, oil. I, I, I get you. We, and, and until we do that, we will continue to fund our own demise. America has been very good at that, by the way, for a very long time. Yeah, but who are they? They manufactured our next enemy. Yeah, but you know, who? You, you said something, if I may, Roy, at the end of your last uh, segment, yes. what I said is that everything you have said until the very end, I agree wholeheartedly with, that, that Obama is actually... Uh, enraging Muslims, uh, giving them the impetus to and the the will to uh, to rise up as fundamentalist Muslims and, and wear us out the, and the world and uh, and that is become extraordinarily destructive to them and also to us. Yes, the only place we disagree and it's in its slight uh, disagreement here is that if you study uh, economics, one of the things that you find is that we have been beguiled into the myth of believing that fascism and communism are at the opposite sides of the economic spectrum. The reality is that communism and fascism are really the same animal. Yes. The only difference between communism and fascism is that in communism uh, you cannot own anything, but, uh, but the government controls everything. In fascism, there are individuals who can own businesses, for example, and can own land, although the government continues to control. In fact, most fascist countries have more overt yeah. control over labor and capital than do communist countries. You know, so it's basically... Let's just, just make a point. Uh, uh, you're exactly right. I'm not arguing with that. I say the two sides of this, to the two, the two the fascism and communism are both evil. They're, they're like the evil mom and dad. Right. <laughs> you see, it's a feminine and masculine. <laughs> right. they're, they're, they're control mechanisms that yeah. emasculate uh, economic production. So my, my point was going to be, Roy, is that the only difference between uh, my understanding of where we're headed and what you said is that up to the point that I think what we're going to find is that the ultimate capitulation of America as we know it is going to be to fascism as opposed to uh, to communism. I mean, you as bright as you as bright as you can be, because because the, who because we're so passive as a, as people, there's, right. there's always going to be the rise of the other extreme. In this case, it's right. fascism, um, you know, the Aryan nation kind of stuff, and right. so they will take the lead, and that's what we're afraid of. We need to take the lead. People need to take the lead, but not wait for the fascists to do it. You know, it's interesting that uh, Yahweh, when he uh, articulated the covenant to uh, Abram, who became Abraham, 
You know what the first thing that he asked of Abram, the very first thing he said to Abram that he needed to do if he wanted to engage in a relationship with God? You know what that was? No. Walk away from your country. Oh, yeah. I agree. Disengage. Disengage from Babylon. Now, in the book of Yirmiyahu, which we know is Jeremiah, yeah. uh, Yahweh wrote uh, the, the book of, uh, of Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, explicitly to Goyim. It's, it's <laughs> unique. It's where, do, where do you get that word? Where do you get that well, word? Goyim, well, Goyim is the Hebrew word for Gentile, not Hebrew. <laughs> yeah, yes. And so, uh, in all of the other prophetic books, the prophetic books are, are, um, are devoted to communicating with the chosen people, with, uh, with uh, Yehudim and with Yisrael. With the case of Yirmiyahu, he says explicitly right at the beginning that this, this revelation is for Goyim. And the entire uh, book is devoted to exposing and condemning the essence of Babylon, which Yahweh denounces as religion and politics. So the very thing that, that God is asking us to leave before we engage in a relationship with him is our religious and political affiliation. Right and on the money. Right. So if people don't want to be the sheeple that you, uh, you describe, the term that I also use, we may be uh, uh, brothers from a different mother. <laughs> people yes. don't want to be sheeple, and they don't want to be indoctrinated, and they don't want to, to suffer from be, the corruption of deceit. The very first thing they have to do is disassociate themselves from religion and politics because that's the wellspring of deceit and corruption. Well, it divides us. Well, it, it divides, divides us. us. It confuses us. It divides and confuses us. Yes. And according to God, it is the primary mechanism that separates us from him. Well, we're going to have an... He says is, I don't want you to rely on, on religion and politics. <clears throat> Instead, I want you to rely on me. I, I, I get it. We're on the same page. Right. I don't have an argument with you. I say the same thing. Uh, Craig, I say the same thing. Uh, this is a country, we call it a melting pot, but when you cross the border, leave behind your your conditioning. Leave, leave behind your religion uh, and become one nation under God. But, it, but we're not one that, we're, we're, we're not one that nation under God. We're under, na uh, under, uh, under different gods. But I don't. I don't think that there's one in a thousand Americans that actually knows who God is as He introduced Himself to us. I, I'm beginning to like you more. I can't fight you. I'm not going to. I'll be right back. Back. What's on your mind? Call Roy at one eight hundred eight six six eighty eight eighty three. Listening to Advice Line with Roy Masters. Call Roy at 1 800 866 8883. Yes, Craig um, Wynn seems like a person who, uh, how can I say this? He walks away from religion, but Craig, you're religious in a different no, way. I'm, you're spiritual. You're spiritual. Uh, I have a relationship with uh, Yahweh because I know him personally. And I have yeah. capitalized on his uh, offer of a covenant relationship. God asks us to be unreligious. He really doesn't like religion. I agree. He doesn't like politics. He doesn't like religion. He I agree. He those are terribly corruptive uh, things that, that beguile man into relying on them as opposed to him. Yeah, preachers, and, rabbis. I get it. Right, yes. And, you know, when you really get to the essence of what God wants, and it's, this is uh, very similar to, you know, Einstein would look at the universe and all of its majesty and all of its, uh, its great expanse, and he recognized that he did not understand it until he could come up with a very simple explanation of it. That's what E equals MC squared represents. Energy and matter are exactly the same thing. It's just that uh, matter is a diminished form of energy. That's what E equals MC squared means. And so he explained the entire nature of the universe, and then expanded upon that by explaining that, uh, that the fabric of the universe was space-time and how time was actually a dimension. Fascinating uh, point of view. Well, I, I have a disagreement with that, with him. 
I wrote okay. a book on it. I wrote a book, right. but it's okay. It's okay. Right. I well, guess your point. Well, let's return to that for a moment because I wanted to, uh, to relate it to you, and then I would love to hear your, your concern over uh, Einstein. Yeah. The, what, what I came to recognize when I became a student of the Torah, uh, and Torah does not mean law, it means teaching in, yes. uh, in Hebrew. And when I, I studied it, I came to realize that its presentation was extraordinarily simple. And that all God was trying to communicate is that he wants to be our father, and he would like us to participate in his covenant family. Directly. And that he, is, he established, he says, here are the terms and conditions for you. If you want to participate, the, uh, the, the decision is yours and yours alone. And here are the benefits if you choose to participate, and there is nothing more to it than that. Once you understand that he wants to be dad in the role of father of his family... I get that's that. the covenant. That's why the Torah exists. That's why the universe exists. That's why he authored life. It is really... Well, what are, you, what are you saying about Jesus, then? Well, you probably know that there was no person named Jesus. Jesus the, the J wasn't even developed until the 17th century. And the Us ending mirrors the, uh, the Zeus of, uh, of Greek gods. Uh, he came in his father's name. His father's name is Yahweh. Yahusha, which is the name that Yahweh chose to designate his diminished corporeal man. Uh, but, but you're actually saying there was no such thing as a historical Jesus. The historical. Name Jesus, the name Jesus is completely erroneous. Well, never mind. He, let's call him something else. But no, he did exist. call him by his real name. His what? real name is Yahusha. Okay. I call him by his real name. Uh, but it doesn't matter, you know, but, uh, you, you know, a rose by an, any other name is still uh, a rose. That's not true. Not, not according to God. God says, I have one and only name. And that will be my... Oh, no, all no I'm not saying... All people. I, get, I get where we depart here. You think that I think that Jesus is God like Christians do. I don't. No. I think he, I, I think I, he, I, I think he's the one that, the, uh, who understood everything you said and didn't... It, he, he was against religion, against the Pharisees. He brought well, he, something, your, something that... A direct relationship with God, meaning... If I if, if I'm a, if I if I if I'm to believe you, I mean if you have don't that believe relationship, me. believe Yahweh. Don't believe me. Yeah, you no. Know, but if I believe where you're coming from, if I actually see the God in you, it awakens the God in me, doesn't it? Not. Well, Yahweh, it awakens. It can. Yahweh d devoted himself to communicating with us through his Torah teaching and through his uh, prophets. Well, let me stop you here. Let me hear you stop. Uh, you, you had a good okay. run there. Just let me just... How, look, I'm looking at America that's broken. Psychological warfare. Sure. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, all kinds of traumas and cruelties. Drug, drug devotion. Um, we, we have uh, people in so, prison in any other nation in the world. The question, how... This, my job is, I've seen that stress mm -hmm. is, is, a, is, temp is equivalent to temptation. And if we don't know how to deal with... The, if we don't know how to deal with the world it will multiply its misery in us and go from generation to generation. So mm -hmm. there's got to be some way back, a pathway back to God without having Correct. to study all the Torah and everything else. Uh, uh, well, there is a pathway back, but there's only one place where that pathway is presented. Well, Ed, how is it I found it without going through the Torah and I'm Jewish? Uh, I, I can tell you that there's only one place that the pathway is presented. I don't ever like to uh, get into... Well, uh, that, you didn't answer the question. You didn't answer the belief. question. You didn't answer well, the question. Let me, let me tell you what the pathway is back to God, and then you can uh, 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 tell me whether or not that is the same pathway that uh, you have discovered. Uh, fire away. As it relates, by the way, to, uh, to uh, ending stress, the Hebrew word for that would be shalom, uh, it's, although it's translated, peace. Peace, the word actually means to reconcile a relationship. And uh, when how, relationship, how do you reconcile? How do you get out of the mess okay. you're in? How do you get out of the sin of the world? Yes, Yahweh said that uh, that he had a specific path for the children of his covenant to follow that resolves the primary issues of uh, of humankind. It takes us transitions us from. I have no more, argument with that. More the question. Mortal, the question mortal, is. From imperfect to perfect, from estranged to adopted children, from uh, I love it to, to enriched and to empowered. Okay, See, hold it there. there hold there it are, there. There are hold seven it. steps in that path. Hold it. Hold it. Absolutely okay. brilliant. Absolutely right. Right on the money. But now, 
We can't go. We, you've been out 200 stations. You've been everywhere, um, nations, excuse me, countries. So you've got all this wisdom and you've got all this knowledge that brings you back to some kind of root that suddenly springs up in you with great simplicity, like, a, like the mustard seed that becomes everything, the smallest of all herbs and becomes the greatest of all trees. Uh -huh. However, the average person listening to you right now can't get out of his misery and he can't get out of the, the conflict he's got, the conflict with himself, conflict with the others, uh -huh. drugs, alcohol. How do you present, how do you get to people like that? Because I can. I can. I have been doing it for fifty years. I've, I've, the secret is to be still and know. And there, you know the rest of it. You, really, yeah. you should know the rest of it. Yahweh is a uh, is interesting in that he his most common encouragement for us is very similar to something that you focus on. His yes. single most uh, repetitive encouragement for us is to Shamar Torah. Shemar Yisrael. Yeah, well, Shemar is the Hebrew word for that is typically translated observe, but it uh, observe unfortunately has a religious oh. connotation that is to keep, and that's not what the word means. Shemar Israel, hero Israel, isn't that hero Israel? Well, that's that's Shama. Shama means to listen. Uh, so Shama is to listen. Shemar is to observe. Shemar means to keep your eyes open, uh, focus. Uh, and based upon closely examining and carefully considering what is available uh, to you... Ah, hey, we've got a problem here. We've got a problem. ...in a position to go from knowing to understanding and then... I love it. ...to responding. I love all that. But the problem is, the problem is, how do you awaken people from their hypnotic states? Well, this is the... is a... Is it's all words. Great. All you got is words. You're saying all these wonderful words. They're absolutely right. wonderful. Your, right. your, and, your, your, and your, that your, is God's favorite communication tool is, of course, words. And the enemy of words, the enemy of evidence and reason, is religion. So unless someone is well, it, 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 but religion, religious, but you're using religious words. You're using no, you're using I'm all not, kinds no, of words. I, I'm using Yahweh's words, and Yahweh hates religion. But how do I know you're using well? I'm using, Yahweh's word. I'm using relationship-oriented words. I'm using thinking I agreed, words. Agreed. Agreed. Not faith. Not faith words. Not religious words. Not institutional words. I'm using the words that he chose to use. For example, what does shamar mean? I took it out of the religious context, which is to keep in religion, and I brought it into the the meditative concept, which is, you know, you stress meditation. Well, you don't want to meditate on the molecular weight of... Uh, no, 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 of course. Lent. So you want, to, you want to meditate on that which is wholesome, that which is nourishing, that which... Yeah, is no, no, you don't. Actually, let me stop you right there. What you have to do, what really works for everybody I, that I've helped, I've helped thousands, millions of people, mm -hmm. but, but what really works is to separate the, to separate the soul from the realm of words in their, to being lost in the in a word world where they are talking to themselves and something is talking to them and you have the endless loop of thoughts that are words. You need to separate from the words so that you can hear the wordless word. The wordless word is the magic. Is the word with the words where you have clarity, where you where you have that you find that commonality of all other human beings caught up with everything. And, and my uh, perspective happens to be uh, Yahweh's perspective, which yes, is that exactly, he, exactly. That he represents it's... himself through words, and that words are the medium of uh, of not only communication and of relationships, but of also of. We we are, we're having a lot of fun here, Craig. We're having a lot of fun. I'm enjoying you very much. We have a little bit of difficulty here, but we're going to get over it on the other side of the break. You're listening to Advice Line with Roy Masters. Call Roy at 1 800 866 8883. What's on your mind? Call Roy at 1 800 866 8883. And to continue our uh, discussion with our distinguished guest, Craig Wynn. Craig, are you still there, my friend? Oh, absolutely, Roy. Yeah. Can I can I uh, pose a question? Does yes. God speak to the human mind with a spoken word of language? He re 
revealed himself using words. You, if you want to find him, you will find him in his Torah teaching. No, which is an yeah, you didn't. You didn't. Of words. You, no, I'm asking a direct, a direct question. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have intuition? You have something called intuition. Can you can you think without words? Can you know why you know without knowing why you know? We typically think in words. That's oh no, I, no, no. I didn't say we didn't think in words. I said we are wordy. We we part of us is is language. We speak with language, but language can be destructive. Language can be indoctrinating. You're making those Correct. points. So, did, do you think Adam? Is, let's say Adam existed. I believe he did. But let's yeah. say, do you think God spoke to him in language, or did he spoke 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 to him in a wordless words, which made him understand it and made made him express it in words? His testimony to us regarding the conversations he had with Adam strongly indicates that he communicated with him using words. Uh, I, dis I disagree. I disagree with that. Uh, that's, I can just report to you what his testimony uh, says. Now, whether or not there will be a time in the future where we as purely spiritual entities will be able to communicate without spoken... No, I don't, no, I don't, no I'm not going there. I, I don't that mean that at all. Let me say this. I never went to school. I went to school when I was a kid, just learned reading, writing, and arithmetic. Mm -hmm. I never went to college. And everything, all the books I have written, uh, did not come from other books. I, I told you I don't like reading. Mm -hmm. But I can write. And w when I write and when I speak, my heart speaks. But I, what, it's put, the words are put in my mouth. And when I discover something... It doesn't, it doesn't come to me in words. It first comes in intuition, a hunch. All of a sudden, words form around it. But it doesn't come as a noise. It comes as intuition. The, uh, perspective on that is that when... You, you can't speak, you can't speak, but you can't speak for him. Well, you, you, well, no, you knew you're speaking for him as no, if you... Uh, no, you he spoke to us and shared his mind. You, spoke, you mentioned Adam. Well, let, no, before we go any further, which one of us is more spiritual? One, me, who says God does not speak in words to you; He speaks, He speaks to you with a wordless word, which can form into words and expression and acts, and that sort of thing. So you're saying He speaks to you in a language, and I say that's not true. That can't be true. He speaks to all of us through his Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. He speaks to all of us. He's, he speaks the, through the language of Hebrew, which is very unique among Yeah, but, but lots of people don't understand Hebrew, so how are they going to find uh, God? You don't, you, don't, you don't have to speak Hebrew to understand uh, Hebrew, because there's uh -huh. many interesting tools. There, there's some aspects. Let me just share some aspects. Well, okay, let me ask you a question. Let me just, but let me just, we're going to have a little fight here. Okay, so have a little nice fight together. And that's okay. Uh, but but okay, I've been... Great. Uh, how are you going to how are you going to find you're going to go to all the world it will speak different languages how are you going to communicate with all the people with different languages and don't know anything about hebrew how are you going to convince is, them all it that is, it's not possible it is very easy to translate a hebrew word and hebrew grammar into any language in fact that's what i was going to share some of the uniquenesses <laughs> of hebrew grammar that will uh, that goes beyond the words. No, the, the words... The meanings of the words. The words that you get in the Bible are, 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 are the, 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 the expression, a human expression of what they... See, my words to you this evening, when I question this way, is when I express myself, I'm not speaking from a, just from a memory uh, and from what people tell me. I'm speaking to you from intuition means what I've written mm -hmm. uh, and, when, and when I speak, even though it's the same thing over and over again, it do, isn't, the, I'm not using, I'm not, uh, I'm an actor on the stage using the same words over and over right. again, I'll be bored. Right. Yeah, I, it has to be refreshed, it has to be refreshed by the wordless word of we're, life force. We're, we're similar in this regard in that when I speak in any discussion, I speak from a position of understanding, so the words flow out <laughs> of an understanding. Yes, it's, but that's wordless. Wrote. That's wordless. But, but here's the, the 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 concept. There's some there's just some thoughts on Hebrew that you might find. Uh, yeah, I, listen, I'm, I'm Jewish, you know. I'm born. Yes, I'm born I know, Jewish. I know. Let me show you something. And I ran away from it. 
Right. Let me, and, uh, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm... I left my, li- I left my religion behind, I, I as you said. I'm an opponent, of, I'm an opponent <laughs> of Judaism. I'm not an advocate of Judaism. I'm an opponent. I'm adverse to Judaism. I am, uh, I am pro the race. I'm extraordinarily supportive of Israel, but, uh, but not... I, I can hear that. I can, there's not much difference but, between but, us. Let me share with you some things about Hebrew that have nothing to do with religion. One of the things about Hebrew that is very unique is that Hebrew verbs, unlike other languages, particularly English, are not stuck in time. There is no past, present, or future tense in scriptural Hebrew. Every verb in Hebrew is eternally true. Okay, I'll answer that. I'll, I'll example, example, uh, hold it, hold a second. Give me an example of it. The verb oh. that, that is the basis of Yahweh's name, he tells us, is Haya. Haya is the Hebrew verb to mean uh, exists. What it says in the first person is, I was, I am, I will be. Hold the line, hold the line, hold the line. Okay. We'll come back. <laughs> we come back with a bit of fun here. Okay, we'll be right back with Craig Quinn. Listening to Advice Line with Roy Masters. You can reach Roy at 1 800 866 8883. That's 1 800 866 8883. What's on your mind? Call Roy at 1 800 866 8883. My delightful guest is Craig Wynn, and the last thing he said, and I need to rebut that, he said Hebrew words are timeless, they don't have a, a date on them, there's, 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 no, there's no time t- stamped on it. The truth of the matter is that words exist in time and space, so therefore they're subject to time. So that's not correct. But, so where we need to find, where we find God is in a timeless place, and so that's what be still and know means. Be still means you cannot be still because if you're lo- as long as your consciousness is entangled with the emotions of your body and the, and the sins of the world, so to speak, the effects of the world, because you are subject to the the the, the of of, a, of the of environment and your creation is all material, it's all subject to space and time, words, everything. But to find God, you have to separate the soul. You have to find a way to disengage your soul from your your monkey brain that's full of words and noises and conditioning. And there you approach the throne of the Almighty. Therefore, you're in a space where there's no space, there's a place where there's no space and time, and that's where the soul receives its intuition. Let's See, that's, turn to the, uh, the insights that can be gleaned. Like that. A language where, where verbs are not stuck in time. Well, I think Yahweh. English is pretty good. I think English yeah, will work Yahweh. just fine. Uh, no, in, in every every English verb is stuck in time. But but you're doing pretty good with English. You're not speaking Hebrew, right? The well, you can communicate the nature of a Hebrew verb, which are not stuck in time. They're eternally true. Uh, uh, I can't understand the, what you're saying. The word stuck in time. English words. Let I, me, I don't think you got. Give you the uh, comparison. Yahweh equates himself more often to light than anything else. One of the things, returning to Einstein, that Einstein pointed out to us is that uh, on a photon of light, time exists. There is no past, present, or future tense related to to light. If you're on a photon of light, time simply exists. On a photon of light, you are eternal because time is. No, I don't think you know what, I don't think you know what you're talking about. So, so you better get off that. <laughs> I know. I, it's not the nature of light. You just have an opinion of a person, but the point is, a, 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 um, a particle of light relative to gravity creates a curve as it go, goes through through space and time. It has a curve around it, and that's time. Time. If you if you could have a if you were uh, if um, a person a, a material light is not is not mass. If you were if you could be a, a ghost, if you no, no. If you if if you were if you were a ghost, if you could be a, a ghost and ride on not a person, ride on a on a on a, 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 a photon of light. If you could ride on it, you'd see this time there. That is time. It, it, it the curve of of light going through space like a, a boat going through water. That is time, and that is gravity. You'd see that time does exist for the the for the photon. It does exist. 
Uh, and, and Einstein's wrong about that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, then, uh, then uh, I would agree with uh, Einstein in uh, in this, as would uh, all scientific tests, that on a photon of light, time simply exists. That that the no, it does. And and I, you don't have to be a Hebrew scholar to understand that if you listen to the wordless word, the little hunches that come to your mind, that knows right from wrong, and yield to that, and understand that stress is temptation and words cause the temptation to work what's on your mind call Roy at 1-800-866-8883 ok Craig Wynn the spoken word Spoken by the right person who has the, the wordless word in him. The spoken word leads people to the unspoken word, which says, Ah, I see. You're speaking of understanding. Let me yeah, share with but, you the spoken word, but the spoken word leads concept. you to that. Let me share with you an interesting concept which will bridge the, uh, the gap between Yahweh's testimony and uh, what you're sharing here. When Yahweh was speaking of uh, Adam, he told Adam, he told us that Adam had two things that uh, that were part of his nature. One of them was a nephesh, which is a soul, and all animals have a soul. That is no, no, animals don't have souls. I don't. Uh, all animals have a soul, according to God. I know, I know, so I don't. Yahweh, Yahweh's position: you can choose anyone you want, but according to Yahweh. All animals have souls, including humans. It's a so, term do, do you like do you like chicken? And it's let me let me finish the thought, and then uh, I'm going to share with you the bridging concept <laughs> that may be helpful. Okay. Yahweh says all all animals have souls, including man, and it is he uses the term nephesh. It's simply consciousness. It's the ability to observe one's environment and respond to it. The thing that he gave Adam that made Adam unique and made Adam more like God was a nasalma. A nasalma is our conscience. A nasalma. A nasalma. Yeah, I yeah, know that. Nishama. And what the nasalma does is it enables us to process information such that we transition from knowing, which has limited value, to understanding you're missing which has something the ultimate value that neshama that you're talking about is a soul and that no, soul no, entangles the soul it's the neshama is our is our understanding which is the seat of good judgment it's our ability yeah agreed to agreed we say understand. it differently yeah we we agree with that but but i've got to get you to the point if i can that the consciousness that human beings have is holy and it has a relationship to listen to the wordless word of God because how did Moses know what to do he never was brought up to was never brought up in a religious community all of a sudden he he was enlightened and what happened to Abraham Isaac and Jacob they never had any books they, they never had any books reject the religion to form a relationship with Yahweh. Yeah, yeah but, but the point... The religious is, community of, of Egypt, he had to reject the religion but he, to form they, a relationship. But, but the word, no word, no spoken words came to him. They not, all had this not, intuition. Not according to God. No, I don't God know which he, God you're God talking about. He introduced himself to him in person and spoke to him, and they had uh, quite the conversation. In fact, the interesting part of of uh, Moshe's uh, discussion with Yahweh is that Moshe didn't want to speak on behalf of, uh, of Yahweh to the children of Israel because he said he had a thick tongue and that he was not effective at articulating uh, words. And God said, uh, you are still the person that I want to go, but it's still your choice. The, the, question, the, question, the, question, the question is, how did, why did um, um, uh, Moses, mm -hmm. why did he kill the, the taskmaster when he could have been a good 
Egyptian and did away with him the way he wanted to for any reason he wanted to give. He wasn't, he, there's something in him that was not, wor- there's something in him working that wasn't words. Right, the Nasama, which is the seat of good judgment. It was yeah. functional and... Uh, yeah, but who's sitting in that seat? I mean, <laughs> well, 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 who's giving, is, you, the, who's the, giving the, you the judgment? The Nasama is a tool. It's a, it's a tool. It would, the tool of the Nasama is the least used muscle well, listen, of listen. Our nature today, which is the ability to process information and exercise good judgment. It's well, listen, listen, listen. We've come to the end of the program, uh, ah. uh, Craig. It's really, really good. It was a lot of fun. Are you, are you, you're, you are a brother from another mother, and I haven't met the likes of you for a long time. I would love to do it again, and it's even fun when we when we disagree about it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We agree to disagree, and it's wonderful. A lively discussion. Yes, sir. Let's do it again. I, I do, a pre- do you want to make a promo over your book or anything like that before you leave? Well, no, if, if people want to communicate with me or read what I've written, go to yadayad.com, and all of the 15 books that I've written are available there free. Yada, well, yada, yada sounds Hebrew. <laughs> yada means no, and Hebrew and Yah is the shortened version of Yahweh's name. I, I was just joking, but it's real. <laughs> I can't. Yeah, so absolutely. Yada means to know Hebrew. Because when I, when I say to someone's talking too much, it's yada, yada, yada. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's, it's uh, a colloquial term, yada, yada, yada. But yada actually does mean to know in, uh, in Hebrew. It means to know in a relational sense. Well, uh, I'm, I'm happy to know about that. I appreciate your discussion and your time, and we must do this again sometime. I had great fun. God bless you. Uh, thank you, Roy. God bless. Bye. You. Thank you. Okay, well that was fun. Yeah, I, I wish I wish more people would call me and have give me a hard time. I love it, uh, but I'm just trying to say that it's very simple. You you can't go through all that, all that, all the Torahs and everything. It's just it's you spend your whole life, you know, finding that what he's talking about, but in this in a in a fraction of a minute, Jesus, when he came here, he brought the understanding because of who he was. And people, he wakened that, that sleeping self. That's what we are trying to do on this program. I'm Roy Masters with Advice Line. I do hope you enjoyed our guest.